Hello my friends and welcome. Today's story is about the evictions in 19th century Ireland, and right up until the end to British rule, to the formation of the Irish Free State. The 19th century was a difficult one for Ireland's people. Not only did our ancestors have to endure, over a century of evictions, but they had to try and survive through what was, and still is, Europe's worst famine to date. Most folk in Ireland were overwhelmingly rural. In 1847 four-fifths of the population lived in hamlets smaller than 20 houses, and were extremely poor. This ratio declined over the century, but only due to famine, and emigration from rural areas, and not from growth of the towns and cities. During the famine an estimated half a million families were evicted from their homes, by wealthy English landlords, most of who had never even set a foot on Irish soil. Another flurry of evictions occurred following the heated general ballots, of 1841 and 1852, when landlords reacted to their waning political influence, by evicting tenants. When the potato blight struck in 1845, these landlords initially held off on gathering rent, and even contributed to relief schemes, but only because they were hopeful that the famine would be a short-lived crisis. But some landlords used this period of distress to their own advantage. They moved to evict tenants, particularly those in arrears. It was a deplorable clearance system of human beings, which had extended across the country. The introduction of various acts heralded many phases of evictions, which saw little sympathy for the plight of the poor, as the bailiffs and police moved in to erase the poorer classes from the landscape. These clearances quickly gained notoriety. In 1847, the sheer scale of eviction across Ireland prompted newspapers to employ special correspondents, who visited the scene of clearances. Among the reporters in the field was James McCarthy, who led the way in reporting on the scenes of havoc and despair. James had no shortage of material to report on, particularly in counties Clare and Tipperary. Reporters like him were successful in harnessing public opinion, and in some instances preventing eviction. It was often a perilous task and James was assailed and insulted in the discharge of his duty, by some of the disgruntled wretches who were employed in leveling the houses of the evicted tenants. Yet he was undeterred in reporting eviction, including at the Waller estate in Limerick where he described the evicted being left to burrow into the earth for shelter. The so-called exterminators were frequently challenged by the local press who were quick to report on the sensational aspects of eviction, especially where women and young children were ejected. Following evictions at the West Trop estate in Clare, it was reported that the body of a young boy had been found dead and eaten by dogs. With the famine in full swing and people at their weakest, with hunger, emigration, and death, there was no mood to fight back at these cruel landlords, so the evictions continued. By the 1870s however, people were starting to have enough. At this time 50% of the island was owned by a few dozen families, and from 1850 they extracted £340 million in rent, while only 4% was reinvested. This led landlords to take on a role of non-productive managers within the island's overall economy. Conflict between landlords and tenants arose from opposing viewpoints on such issues as land consolidation, security of tenure, transition from tillage to grazing, and the role of the market. There were deep conflicts too, concerning property rights. Irish law guaranteed that a tenant had a right to the property they rented. They could buy that share and sell it onto the next tenant, or back to the landlord. But Ireland was under British rule and English law, which protected the absolute property rights of the landlord. The Irish nationalist politician Isaac Butt pointed out the fact that, the English property laws on the pauper Irish tenants, was worse than the heaviest yoke of feudal servitude. On 20 April, 1879, 
at a mass meeting in Irish Town, County Mayo, organized by local and Dublin-based activists, led by Michael David and James Daly. It was declared that the land war had begun. The activists tried to mobilize an alliance of tenant farmers, shopkeepers, and clergy, in favor of land reform. Although the clergy refused to participate, some 7 to 13,000 people attended the meeting, having come from all parts of Mayo, and counties Roscommon and Galway. The main issue of course, was rent, which was typically paid in the spring, but due to the poor harvest, and the fact that the west of Ireland was in the grip of a famine, tenants could not afford to pay, and many had been threatened, with eviction. The crowd was guided and led into position by local Fenians, recruited by David in an earlier trip, with help from local IRB leader Pat Nelly. Incidentally, the IRB council refused to sanction agrarian activism. Local Fenians organized other meetings, at Clamoris on 25 May, with 200 attendees, and again at Knock on 1 June, with a reported 20,000 to 30,000 turnout in protest of the church's position. Another meeting was held in Westport, County Mayo on 8 June, in protest against the Marquis of Sligo, the largest landowner in Mayo. This crowd attracted over 8,000. For the first time in centuries the authority of landlords to control the land in Ireland was being questioned, and challenged. From the summer of 1879, the Land League and its supporters carried out various activities aimed at preventing evictions, while advancing the cause of tenants. This ranged from protests at sales of leases of evicted tenants, protest meetings some of which were 10,000 plus strong, to more militant riots and even assassinations. The League itself did not officially sanction any illegal activity, however some organizers did advocate more militant methods. One organizer, the Irish-American, Michael Boyton, advocated that land grabbers, people who took the land of evicted tenants, should be given the pill, a 19th century euphemism for shooting someone. Perhaps the most famous and successful tactic of the League was the boycott. Initially called social ostracism, boycotting, saw landlords or those who opposed the League, shunned by their community. They were hissed at, everywhere they went, while no one would speak to them. People also refused to work for ostracized individuals, or sell them any products whatsoever, not even food. Unsurprisingly landlords in Ireland were completely opposed to the demands of the Land League, and refused to reduce rents. In a perverse comment as Ireland faced famine in 1879, Lord Lucan said, he could not give his tenants a reduction in rent, because this meant a reduction in his means. This intransigence of the landlords ensured their own demise. Such was the influence of the League and its supporters, the harvest could only be brought in under the protection of 2,000 soldiers who were drafted into the area. While the League did not attempt to oppose such a large force, the entire operation cost the British state £10,000, to harvest a crop worth a few hundred quid. This was massive victory for the League as the state authorities could not carry out similar actions across the country. The boycott was born. Soon there was a massive wave of repression, which saw nearly all Land League leaders imprisoned. But this only served to make the situation in Ireland worse, with violent incidents soaring, later that year. At the same time the British Prime Minister Gladstone, introduced the 1881 Land Act, which granted a certain number of rights to tenants. But at the same time as that, he brought in the Coercion Act, which effectively outlawed the Land League. The Land League opposed the measure, but as 1881 gave way to 1882, the League was undermined on several levels, by the likes of the British government, in fighting and the church. Earlier, the women who were involved, most notably, Anna and Fanny Parnell, the sisters of Charles Stuart Parnell, had formed the Ladies' Land League. When that was suppressed and most of the organizers were imprisoned, the ladies stepped into the breach, and essentially took over the work of the now illegal Land League. In response to the imprisonment of the organizers, the Land League attempted a rent strike. 
This was heavily opposed by those active on the ground, but the imprisoned leadership forced it through. It was an absolute disaster as Fanny Parnell had predicted, as no groundwork had been done. This only further served to damage the organization. The end of the land war came, in the summer of 1882. Earlier that year Pinel had entered negotiations with the British government that saw him released from prison in what became known as the Kilmainham Treaty. In return for his release, he agreed to quash the Ladies' Land League, not to attempt to resurrect the League, support the 1881 Land Act, and pacify the land movement in Ireland. After three years of struggle this movement of ordinary tenants had dealt a fatal blow to rural landlordism while also transforming the careers and profiles of several Irish historical figures, not least, Charles Stuart Parnell, and Michael David. Ultimately the Land War had been a colossal success, at least from the Land League's perspective. Although the power of landlords would only be broken for a short period in the 20th century, the 1881 Land Act made life almost intolerable for landlords in Ireland. This act and a further amendment in 1887 which widened the scope of the bill, meant it would only be a matter of time before the landlordism in rural Ireland was brought to an end. Funnily enough and typically Irish, we are in a not so dissimilar situation today. The large landowners from England may be long gone, but they have been replaced by large hedge funds, and vulture funds, and private overseas pensions, where a handful of people own the majority of the land. Does that sound familiar? And that my friends is the short history of eviction during the 19th century. Thank you so much for watching, and goodbye for now.